Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Richard. And I am Joey. Welcome to the Big O Silvio Show, a political talk show aimed at the youth of Dragut discussing the trials and tribulations of their everyday lives. Uh, before we get started, we would like to stand and say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, tonight's episode is a very special one indeed, as we are joined by our local state representative, Colleen Gary. Hi, thanks Hello. for having me on. I appreciate it. No problem at all. Uh, how are you, Gary? Are you doing fine tonight? I'm doing well, thanks. I'm keeping my mask on, though, trying to... Uh, I just looked at the numbers, and unfortunately, Drake and Tingsboro, my districts, the numbers are even higher than oh they were goodness, last week. It so seems we're experiencing surges all over. Yeah, here. yeah. So it's um, I'm trying to do the right thing and show people that it's okay to wear a mask mm -hmm. and um, that that's what they should be doing. The numbers um, last week, uh, I didn't figure it out this week because I just saw the numbers, but last week we were in the top 16 really? out of the Commonwealth. Um, and including that were um, Shirley and Middleton that have prisons in it mm -hmm. that have outbreaks. So. We're, we're pretty high, and we've got to start doing more. Um, what, what I've had discussions with the Board of Health and the town manager and, and others, um, we are going to try to do a uh, testing um, free for the folks of Drake and Tingsboro, um, but that probably won't be till January because of logistics of doing it. Mm -hmm. But um, what they're finding out is that with the restrictions that are happening in Massachusetts, and the bar is having to close at 9.30 here. People are going over the border to Pelham, Hudson, Nashua, where there aren't the restrictions, and they're spreading it up there and bringing it home. Mm. So um, it, it really is a very difficult situation being on the border. Right. Now, do you also... Oh, sorry. I was going to say, do you also blame the uh, November holidays? Uh, yes. Thanksgiving for the... That's what the, the statistics show, that it was the, the traveling and intermingling with other people. I did my Thanksgiving. Um, I have one sister who um, she and her husband have been home and um, isolated. She teaches and she's teaching remotely. Mm -hmm. um, he's got health issues. Um, so I did get to have a meal with them. But my other sister who um, has my twin nieces, um, we always have it at their house. Uh, so I picked up a meal outside the door. And I went back and actually sat at my office and did the Zoom thing with them. As I said, make sure you put your, put it on the uh, the iPad where I would be sitting, right. and we did it that way. So, um, you know, it is something that it it, it hurts. It, it it's not what we're used to, but um, you know, it was I don't know how many years ago. My mom had a heart attack right before Christmas, oh my goodness. and we literally spent Christmas Eve in the uh, cardiac care unit at oh, Leahy. I'm so sorry. Yeah, yeah, but thank God she made it through. We, we celebrated Christmas that year, January 12th, when we got her out of the hospital. Really? But, you know, it is uh, a very sad situation when people are in the hospital and you can't be there with them. And, um, you know, uh, and, and the folks who are working there and risking their own lives, and even though they're doing everything right, they're still being exposed. And then they have to bring it home and expose their own family. So, I just ask everybody to please, please do the right thing. Try to continue to wear the mask, social distance, wash your hands. If you can, stay home with your immediate family. There are a lot of people doing the right thing, um, but unfortunately, the numbers continue to climb and the hospitals are getting overwhelmed. Um, and those people in that are working there, they're tired of wearing the mask. They're tired of all of this, but. They're also tired of having to put the phone up to someone who's dying so the loved one can say goodbye. Um, it's something that they've been doing since March, and it's not fair. Um, and you know what it is? And masks have become way too political. It, it, it's like this political thing to wear your mask or not wear your mask. Just wear the goddamn mask. It's, yeah. it's really not that difficult, yeah. you know? The hard part is it fogs up your glasses, but that's okay. Yeah, poor glass wears. Yeah. <laughs> they must yeah. Yeah. Um, really suffer. But, um, Colleen, you know, just to, um, you know, that was kind of a heavy start we had. Yeah, um, sorry about going, that. No, pro no problem at all. Uh, you know, that's what we're here for, conversation. Yeah. Um, 
So you are our local representative, right? And as you know, our youth tends to be um, younger. They may not know exactly what the duties are of a state representative. Right. So, would you like to uh, enlighten us? So, I have been the state representative since my election in 1994. Really? What year were you guys born in? Oh four. <laughs> oh one. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I've been the state representative longer than you've been alive. Um, I kind of think of my job as threefold. One, um, I I am there, as everybody assumes, there to pass the laws right. of the Commonwealth. Um, I'm one of 160 members of the House. We each represent approximately 40,000 people. And um, we go in and we serve on committees. Um, I know you're going to ask me about the committees. I serve on the Judiciary Committee. Mm -hmm. I'm the ranking member of the Judiciary Committee. Um, I serve on the Redistricting Committee, which will be a very interesting thing. Every 10 years, we have to redistrict. so. When a new session starts in January, I'm hoping to stay on that so we can keep our district together. Um, I serve on the Revenue Committee. Um, that is where the contemplation of raising taxes comes in. Um, and uh, I had spent probably at least 10 or 12 years on the Ways and Means Committee, which is actually spending the money. So right. uh, it, was, it was kind of interesting to be put on the Revenue <laughs> Committee on the other end. Um, and then I'm on the uh, Agriculture and Environmental Committee. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been uh, a, a new, new committee for me. Over the years, I've been on most of the committees, I guess. Um, so I like it when I can get put on a different committee to get a different um, look at issues and so forth. Do, uh, do you have a committee that you find a personal favorite or one that you find the most effective? I think the Judiciary Committee, uh, originally we used to have a Criminal Justice Committee. I was actually a vice chair of that, and that handled all the criminal laws. And then there was the Judiciary that handled all of the, um, the civil things, like abortion, euthanasia, that kind of thing, uh, or just the what's going on in the courts. As a practicing attorney myself, I've been practicing now, um, ooh, I don't know how many years now. Um, and I do a lot of family law. So right. it is, it's good for me to be able to bring that real life um, experience to that committee and say, hey, but this is what happens in real life, you know? So, um, so that, I, I think that's probably my favorite committee right now. Um, it's been somewhat frustrating, some of the bills that have been coming out of the Judiciary, Judiciary Committee that I haven't totally agreed with, um, but, that's uh it, it's been pretty cool now with your involvement in lots of you know the committees you said and as well as being a an attorney do you ever have time for yourself <laughs> oh wait a minute i forgot to tell the other parts My, that, <laughs> yeah, just reminded me i got more to do um so besides being on on the committees and and passing laws i advocate for the communities mm -hmm. of draken and tingsboro and and when they're applying for grants right. or if they've got an issue with things then I intercede on behalf of the, the towns. And then the last part, which is probably the majority of the part, is when individuals have issues, in mm -hmm. the, in, in, whether it's something with the registry motor vehicles or something with uh, Department of Mental Health or any of those different agencies, people write to me. We've been getting a lot of calls about unemployment mm -hmm. right now. We've had, a, ever since uh, COVID has hit, there's been a lot of issues about um, people not getting the unemployment or, um, it, it happened to myself. I actually, somebody fraudulently applied for unemployment for me. Really? And yeah, mm. yeah. I guess there were about 25 reps. There were different times and they were either, you know, it wasn't a political statement. It right. was just a, a, a thing where it's like, hey, um, and you have to call everybody to oh, notify them of it. It's a process. Yeah, it's huge. So, if anybody has any questions about that, I have a whole list of what you do when it happens because I had to spend a day doing all that. Oh, you poor thing. So, so it's, but it's, it's good. To, that's probably the most rewarding thing is when you can help people when they really right. need it. And um, so my, I have two aides and they help me a lot with the constituent mm -hmm. work as well as the legislative work. And that must take a lot of stress off your back. Yeah, yeah, they're great. So. Um, so yeah, I have that. I have the law practice. Um, I never married, so I don't have any children. Um, I took care of my parents until they passed 10 years ago. Um, 
So this has really been my life. It's, it, it's been my heart and soul, and, and then um, doing things like starting the Drake It Volunteers or the Foundation for a Better Drake It, some of the, the other activities that we've been involved with. Um, you know, I, I love the, com the communities and uh, Drake It. I was, the year I was born, my father was made principal of Drake It High. Really? Wow. So the first nine years of my life, I was in and out of there and uh, he was principal. My mother swore that I took my first footsteps in Drake It High. <laughs> so, um, so I'm a midi through and through. But, um, so yeah, I, I, I love my job and, uh, you know, I think everybody will say, well, aren't you getting tired of it? Aren't you, you know, ready to give up? And um, I, when I, when I do, I'll let people know, but I right. still love it. I still well, get the you. excitement mm -hmm. of good walking into the chamber and, right. uh, going in and voting and, and, and realizing the history of that chamber and the people who have served there in the past. Um, it really is amazing. And that, that's amazing that, you know, everything you could do for your parents up until, mm -hmm. you know, they pass away. I, yeah. I know I would do the same thing yeah, for both absolutely. of my parents. I love them very, very much. Yeah. I was really lucky. And, um, they actually passed six weeks apart, and oh, unexpectedly, wow. both so of them. We're sorry. But thank you. But I know that I, I have good. I have a lot of faith that they're together and they're watching over us. Um, and you know, they were always proud. Uh, but my mother would always say, "I'm not just proud of Colleen. I'm proud of both of my my all my daughters." And so she made sure that that was out there. But um, but yeah, it, it's been uh, a, a long time, but it's been a great job and I've loved it and, and love to see things get done. Mm. Um, you know, the Tingsboro Bridge, they're now talking about finally redoing the Rook Bridge. Really? Um, no, well, that's about been like that. It's about yeah. time. Yes. Yeah. So th they originally, when they wanted to, when we finally got the money to fix the Tingsboro mm. Bridge, they were going to close it. And they oh, told kidding. us they were going to close it completely and work round the clock and it would be done in one year. Hmm. Then they said, well, if we close it to one lane, it'll be two years. And I just knew that it wasn't gonna how happen. Long has it been? So we pushed <laughs> and pushed and we got, um, we got the administration to spend the additional millions of dollars right. to do the temporary bridge right next door to it. Hmm. So that we had, it delayed it a little bit, but we had a, a, a bridge to go over back and forth. Right. Um, there was a lot of discussion about whether we should keep it up, but right. the, it, the, the traffic pattern just wasn't gonna work out. Right. Um, and then they did the other traffic. So I think it was over $15 million that got spent in that small town, um, you know, smaller than Drake it. And um, that was probably one of the most proud things that, that I'm, I have been able to accomplish. That and then just all the different um, you right. know, uh, things that we've done here in town, uh, continuing the community preservation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I was proud to vote for that in the very beginning to create it. And we've gotten so many things like Harmony Hall, mm -hmm. you know, farmland. All um, the walking trails, those Walking have been trails, all of those things. Um, Drake at High's renovation. Mm -hmm. um, right. You know, so there's and the new Richardson School. So there's so many different things that, that you feel like you've got your fingerprints on in right. some way that it's... Uh, it's been it's been a great ride. So you know, with your fingerprints being everywhere, you know, you've uh, obviously been you know around for a long time uh, as a long-term public servant, as you know I put it. <laughs> um, I feel like there are a lot of negative connotations that come with being a long-term public servant. Um, right. Certainly, I don't think none of them apply in your case. But Thanks. how do you? You're, you're welcome. Uh, how do you feel about uh, long-term? Well, I think it's when they stop listening mm -hmm. that's the problem. Um, I think that when if you're still as ex excited about it, if you still right. have, uh, I mean, I was not challenged this last time, which was really nice, especially in this COVID time. Mm -hmm. I don't know how anybody could campaign. It would have been um, a headache. It's yeah, because I'm used to door knocking and right. I would not feel comfortable oh my goodness. Yeah. knocking on someone's door in the middle of COVID. God forbid I passed it on to them. I, I would right. feel terrible. So, um, and then you couldn't have fundraisers. You couldn't do a lot of things that we normally do. So um, it, it would have been very, very difficult. But I think that's part of it is that um, I've pretty much, it's only been a few times that I've been unopposed. I've been pretty much always kept on my toes and right. always had to be accountable. I think it's when people, um, they raise a lot of money and then they right. don't have to spend it and then they have this big war chest that people are afraid to run against right. them um 
that that's when they can take it for granted. Uh, I've never taken it for granted. I learned very early on, you run like you're behind. Absolutely. And, yeah, and you just do whatever you need to do because um, the money in the bank the day after you lose isn't gonna do you any good. So, Absolutely. Um, so we've never taken it for granted and we've worked our tails off. Even when people have said, oh, you're all set, you're all set. Right. No, well, I want the job, I wanna prove to people that I, that I do. So, you know, I think it's a little bit different from like Washington. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you hear a lot of people say they only see their person, uh, the senator, right. every six years, things like that. Um, you know, honestly, I don't think Elizabeth Warren has ever stepped foot in town. I, I, yeah, I, I doubt that. I, I don't remember yeah. a sighting of her in town yeah. either. Yeah, so, it, you know, that's that's when you sit there and, and when they're too busy running for higher office mm -hmm. Absol right. they, rather they, than it, what it, they have. Power it hungry. seems like they forget about everyone else. Yeah. But that doesn't seem to apply with you. You seem Not to care all. for all of the people Thank you. within Thank you. the towns. Thank you. Know, you. you know, with that in mind and you winning, you know, your new term, um, apart from COVID, do you see any uh, priorities at this moment that you'd like to uh, focus on? Well, I think future? we have to really rebuild the economy, although mm -hmm. the numbers are pretty good right now, mm -hmm. um, amazingly. Uh, I guess we still have to find out what's going to happen if another federal package is going to come in or not. I mean, the small businesses have really been hurt pretty badly. Absolutely. Um, you know, that's, I, I hear from so many of the small businesses, especially like the restaurants, um, you know, they're doing the best they can to do, to, to do what they've been told to do with the distancing and the numbers of people and wearing the masks and doing all of that. They've tried so many things like the takeout when they didn't do takeout before, or, um, you know, it, it's, uh, they've really tried to reinvent themselves during this whole thing. And caterers are having a terrible time. Oh, I can imagine. Um, you know, that they, you know, I had one caterer who told me that he would do like 60 cookouts during the year mm -hmm. and there would be like a couple hundred people at each one like like company picnics and so forth and he had only done like five and there were only like 20 people at each one well, so yeah. so it's we really got to be able to um reinforce the right. small businesses and, and and help them back because you know it's not just them and their business and their livelihood and everything they built up but it's their employees Absolutely. as well so I think the economy is going to be the biggest thing that we're going to look at. So do you support the closures of um, the small businesses for COVID? It's really hard. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, there was, there's been a lot of um, beating up the governor for doing what he thought was right. Uh, I think that he did do a lot that he felt he needed to do. I can't see how he got any kind of political mileage by closing anything. Um, and I have known him for a while now, and I know him to be a caring, um, thoughtful, um, intelligent man. And um, I don't think it's a power play by him. I think he's trying to do the best he could with the information that he's receiving from the medical personnel. Um, you know, you gotta look back to when this all happened in March. It was a novel one. We didn't know right. much about it at all. Now we've got, rem, rem, I can never say it, remesivir. We've got some of these other treatments right. that are helping. Um, and we've got the vaccines on the way. So, you know, I think things are a little bit differently, different than they were in the spring right. when I really think that they had to close down because we just didn't know exactly how it was going to transmit. We didn't know, like now we're finding that it's more being person to person right. in the air. Right. I mean, if you think back to when people were, you know, washing down all of their groceries coming in the house right. or leaving them in the garage for two days or, and you know. You still have to be careful too because people are still handling your groceries. Right. You know, make sure you're sanitizing your hands, you know, right. wiping down your full foam of al alcohol. Yeah. And it's a rabbit, it really is a rabbit hole. You just, right, right. Now, so would you, now we think that, that we know more about how things are being spread and that the businesses can stay open in a way that is um, as long as they continue to do right. the right thing. Now I'm hearing that, you know, like some of the bartenders are leaving at 930 and going and helping with the overcrowds up in New Hampshire. And then the masks are off and right. 
they're coming back and they're bringing it back to Drake. So, so we've got to have people who are going to stick with the regulations regarding, regardless of whether you go to New Hampshire or not, mm -hmm. wear the mask, do the right thing. Right. Now, I know Richard has a question about the masks, but before we get into that, would you take a vaccine when distributed to the public? Yes. Yes. Yeah, okay. I would. Absolutely. Um, you know, I heard you um, mention that you, so I assume you are a supporter of Governor Baker and what he has done for yes. the virus. I'm actually one of uh, five or six Democrats that supported him openly really? last time. That's, um, you know, I was going to segue into that. It, it's funny that I thought you mentioned that because, you know, he is known in the state as a rhino, <laughs> you know, a, a Republican in name only. Yeah. Which um, I, I, I don't really agree with that. I think the reason why they call him a rhino is because he's, according to Republicans in Massachusetts, he's acting outside of his own party. I mean, when you're trying to keep the people of Massachusetts safe, he's done that. Well, you know, Governor Baker, you know, I can't say I agree with him, you know, I die on everything, but uh, to digress anyways, um, I suppose some people would refer to you as a dino, you know, referring to Absolutely. the Democratic Party. Absolutely. How do you feel about the state of the modern Democratic Party? I get concerned because we are supposed to be the party of uh, acceptance mm -hmm. and um, the big tent, as they call it. Um, and I was, I'm a pro-life person. Mm -hmm. um, and to have the national head of the Democratic Party tell me that, or tell us, that there should be no pro-life Democrats in elected office. Um, you know, I've been a Democrat my whole life, and um, you know, the idea that somebody's gonna try to push me out of my right. party because of that. And there are other pro-life Democrats as well. I believe um, JFK was pro-life. Yes. Yes, and so I, you know, I go back to JFK. I'm a JFK Democrat. I am not the one of these progressive socialist um, types of Democrats who have kind of taken over the party. You know, um, why do you think we've seen such a rise in socialism and communism in the Democratic Party? You know, it goes back to, and I've never been really that involved in the Democratic, right. mass Democratic Party, um, but it's my understanding it used to be if you were elected to the town committees, then you would then put into the convention. Mm -hmm. um, but they have added on, you know, all sorts of, if you're a French speaking person, if you're a gay or lesbian person, if you're a, a, a you know, a transvestite, if you're this or that, like all these different things have been add on. So they weren't people that were elected right. by anybody. To be on the town committee, you have to be elected by the Democrats of your community on the presidential primary ballot. Um, and or then you can be added on at, right. at some point. But so now it's at the point that all of these minority m add ons, it's my understanding, are pretty much taking over the party from the people who are actually elected by the Democrats in the local community. It's very sad. It really is. It, so it, yeah. it's, it's frustrating because for them to look at me and think that I'm not a Democrat when I'm, You're the original. You, yeah, yes, you I, are. And I'm not, you know, I, I don't want to give up on... You are the true definition of a, of a polite Democrat. Yeah. Would you ever consider switching parties? I actually thought about that. Really? Um, I have been approached by folks. I did think about it. Um, my biggest concern is about the redistricting. Mm -hmm. And there is so much control um, in the redistricting. And if I were to then become a member of minority party, would they then... Um, aim at my district and and do yeah. something to right. it now so. a, a, a big issue on the republican side is you know this they're very pro second amendment what, what's your opinion on like the gun control yeah. and you know the second i amendment? actually have my license to carry mm -hmm. um, do you really yeah interesting yeah. good for um, you you know i am um i am someone that i don't like to sit back and let somebody else right. get hurt right. or whatever that's why i started you know, helping with civilian searches of missing people in the community. I just can't sit back. And when right. San Bernardino shooting happened, I thought, what if I was at a place of business and all of a sudden somebody is shooting up somebody? I would want to be able to help. Right. And um, so I did get my license to carry. Um, and uh, I may be buying myself a gun for Christmas. I've also been in a position where... Um, because I'm a public figure and my address is known, um, I've actually had a couple of situations where uh, someone who was mentally ill 
started really? to stalk me. Ooh, and yeah. um, th that was when my parents were alive. And I had to show them a picture of her and say, if she ever comes to the house, don't open the door and so forth. So um, yeah, it might be time so, for a gun. So, right. per you know, personal protection. Mm -hmm. um, I hadn't gotten one because I knew that if I had one, I'd have to be willing to use it. Right. Right. And um, I had a great opportunity this past fall to go down to the state police training academy and they showed us how to use the gun they showed us how to use the taser they showed us all of the levels of um use of force and when you know when it rises to the next level and so forth we actually went through scenarios where we had um you know that they put up these uh mats like you have in the gym for right. like uh wrestling and stuff and so a little room that they made out of the mats and you had to stand you had your taser and you had your gun and you had to face the wall and all of a sudden you know, they tell you to turn around and two police officers are coming in but they're in those michelin suits right and um and you had to play the scenario which which weapon would you use under that scenario and how would you do it and so forth and they did it four or five times with different scenarios. Unfortunately, I did the right thing. Another time we were um, in a big room with a video and it was me and my partner supposedly and we had to go through the whole thing and talk to people on the video and oh, try the to virtual decide. reality uh, type. It of. wasn't the actual one. I'll, that was another thing we did though, but this one was just a video and really? um, I ended up having to shoot the gentleman that was coming towards oh us my and um, so he looked like he had a gun um, and another police officer was coming from the other side. So to protect her, I had to try to shoot him. Um, and uh, it, it, was, it was interesting to put yourself in those scenarios. Right. The, the virtual ones though were amazing. They really? actually had two scenarios on it. One was um, an autistic young man and the police get called, but you could see it from his point of view and then all of a sudden you were seeing it from the responding police officer's view and just the virtual reality. It's the first time I've ever used one of those. It was like A or B and you just look right. and I got the right answer on that. And then the next scenario was uh, schizophrenic mm -hmm. and you saw it from their point of view and then you saw it from the police officer's point of view. Um, again, fortunately I got it right. But so I think I have a, a, a pretty good judgment now of being able to say yeah, I could use it right. in the right circumstances for protection. Um, so that it was a very interesting thing. We talked to the Colonel about it, that he needs to do that with every legislator uh, before this police reform bill. I Absolutely. think it would have been essential for members to actually be there and see what these people have to do on a day to day basis. Right. And um, people can actually look. They showed us some videos from YouTube of actual scenarios. And um, one was a, a girl who, had, uh, a female uh, female police officer who got a call of a uh, uh, roommate dispute. And she goes to the door, knocks on the door, steps back, and the woman answers the door with a knife lunging at her. Uh, it was just amazing. And to see this police officer be able to get back down behind and um, the, the video cameras, you know, I, I believe um, the police are now at the point, it will protect them. Right, oh, the body, um, 100%. So yeah, I'm so I think, you know, I think they're, you know, I think they're on board. That was one of my amendments to it was to increase how quickly we get these, these audio cameras onto police offices. Right. Because um, it's going to take some time. But, you know, especially with eliminating their, um, their immunity issue, um, we need to protect them or we're not going to find the right people to be police officers. Absolutely. I agree. Now, you know, talking about police, um, we had a conversation earlier about, you know, you choosing reform over defunding. Right. I, I agree with that. Now, how could we reform some of these police departments to make them more, you know, equality, fair, and, and make sure everyone receives fair treatment? Yeah. You know, it's funny because um, we've had a lot of discussions that I met with the Drake police officers and we talked about a lot of things and, and, and perception is so different from the reality. Um, they already don't use chokeholds unless it's their life versus the other person. Um, they don't do, um, they don't do uh, mace. What was right. the other? Uh, uh, the pepper. 
They use pepper spray, yeah. but they don't use the chemical weapon that... Oh, the tear gas. Tear gas. Yeah, tear yes. gas. They yes. already don't use tear gas. Um, learning at this event, um, the young woman that was killed because she got shot in the eye at the, at the Red Sox thing, um, that was a lead-tipped beanbag type thing that oh the Boston police had, but the state police do not use that. Local police do not use that. Um, they actually had the beanbags and had us feel them to see what it would be, would right. be like. Um, so there's so many things that we already don't do that other states do. Um, you know, it, it, it's frustrating because I think that we have a better uh, education system for right. our police offices. Mm. They already learn uh, implicit bias and all of that. Um, so we don't see those cases. You don't hear about those cases in Massachusetts. Right. And when I, one time I looked it up because they were talking about, you know, the innocent black men who are being killed in Massachusetts by police officers. So I Googled it. And when I went through black men killed by Massachusetts police officers, each one of them, it was a situation that was either a police officer or right. them. Which and unfortunately, I feel like a lot of people don't really um, yeah. pay any attention. No, they, yeah. they don't read into it that, you know, that resisting arrest. You, yeah, you cannot it's a real threat. You, it is, you, it's you a real cannot threat. resist arrest from a police officer. That, that, you, you cannot. You no. can, it, but I mean, the very first one I saw was a, um, a, a black man uh, the police officer had been called for domestic, which mm. is the most dangerous oh, situation for them. Yes. And he knocked on the door, and the and the guy came at him with two knives. Uh, what are you going to do? What do you want him to do? You yeah. know, he's and not, the, not going to just stand there. Or run away. <laughs> yeah. And and the interesting thing that I found is the tasers, the, the statistics on the tasers are they're only effective 40% of the time. Really? Because they've got to be able to both ends have to clip onto you or yeah. it won't send. So does send that mean thing. if only one end hooks on you, it won't work? Right. It defeats the purpose of and it? And if you've got a winter coat on or something like that, right. it's not going to. So, and then the other question was, you know, why can't they just shoot them in the leg so that they don't right. kill them and all that? I feel like it's very hard to aim for a person's, uh, well, a that's person's they, leg. It, they say they're already under stress anyway mm -hmm. and that, um, you don't know if the other person's going to have a gun. You don't know what what they're going to Absolutely. do. Absolutely. And that you're they're trained to hit center mass because your adrenaline is going at that point. You have to go for the largest largest target. So so you know, speaking of like uh, police and whatnot, I know locally. I believe what is it? I believe we usually have three officers active at at one time. Is that we, around on what shift? It is? I, I think it, that, yeah. yeah, I think it's three. So that's and about they're always by themselves. Absolutely. Unless right. they're training, and that's not that's not good. Oh no, I I definitely support you know partners, but um regardless, you know that's about what one officer per ten thousand people. Mm, yeah. Do you think that the Drago Police Department is understaffed? I think that it certainly would be better to have more, mm -hmm. but we've also got to figure out how we afford it, and right. um, you know even the firefighters, they've you know only in the last few years have they been able to get up to um, three men in a, in a really yeah in, in, a, in a in a vehicle. Um, oh yes, yes. So um, you know, it, it's there's a lot of a lot of expensive things out there that to be the best that we could be, we would have more paraprofessionals right. in the schools, and we would have more, you know, advanced schooling, um, advanced topics for kids to to learn. We'd have more um, advanced. Um, you know, we have to take care of the special ed kids, mm -hmm. but there should be something for the advanced kids as well. Right. Um, we need more police officers. We mm -hmm. need more firefighters. Especially, you know. I feel like we've had a massive crime, or not massive, but we definitely had, you know, a spike in the crime rates. So we had that bank robbery the other day, yeah. um, the carjacking. And then and, you you've, know. you've been having lots of people going around and putting, uh, burning, putting on fire the, oh, the, the blue trash, trash barrels. Yeah. Yes. You know, and, and it goes out to show that, you know, if we have more security guards and banks, you know, schools, you know, you, you'll see less crime, hopefully. Absolutely, you know, and people people call, you know, people will say less police officers, less crime, which, you know, Drake it, we're a pretty calm town as it is, and we only have three officers, right. and look what's happening. And look, look at Minnesota. They Imagine that, oh my goodness. Minnesota defunded their police for a short amount of time, and 
that backfired on them. And, and the, argue, the argument that I always hear is, well, we're not saying take away from the police, but you should have social workers who will do that. The Drake Police Department already works with social workers. Right. Um, my, both my sisters are teachers. They followed in my parents' footsteps. Um, but one of them took some time off and became a social worker. And she was going out to um, meet with clients. Some of them were in abandoned buildings. Mm -hmm. um, and during that time, um, there was a, a social worker that was killed, shot and killed up in Nashua. You know, so I don't think the social workers want to be the only ones yeah, absolutely. going yeah, to no the thank scene. You. And Especially I think, like a domestic situation. Yeah. You know, that would, that would, uh, I would hate to see that happen. Yeah. So, I mean, we've got to keep everybody. And that's what they kept drilling on, on us um, one of the scenarios that we had to do uh, we were going in and this um, the video was a gentleman sitting there and I had asked the woman and, and that's the hard part with the videos they can't answer you back right but I said well what is he doing where how where is he how long has he been there and I'm trying to get more background and when we went in it was um, into the room he was sitting there and he was drinking and there was a gun right next to him. And um, during the scenario, we were trying to talk him down. And before we could do that, um, I was second on that one, the primary, primary officer. Um, probably should have hit him with the taser right. because he was close enough. He probably could have gotten in with the taser. Instead, the gentleman picked up the gun and shot himself. Oh, my goodness. So sometimes the use of force is to protect that person. Do you, know? You, so, you know, do you, these virtual, you know, experiences that you're talking about, um, are these open to anybody or do you have to? This was, um, this was the very first time that we've done, done anything like that. And um, I think that it would be good. I, at one point, there was a police academy here in town that civilians oh, could I've go heard, yeah. to. Yes, yes. And I actually, I, I met one of the police officers the night I met with them. He had gone to one of those, and then he had decided that he wanted to be a police officer. Really? Mm -hmm. um, I've had that opportunity, and then I, uh, two years ago, I think, I had the opportunity to go to um, a fire academy and actually wear all of the suit and right. sweat in that suit. <laughs> Um, I, I was able to cut open a car um, to help extract somebody being in the in the hothouse uh, where they lit the right. the hay on fire, and and the second one now knowing it was a drill, knowing that I was okay, that it wasn't, and I had a partner with me, Leo McMahon, who just retired from the Drake Fire Fire Department. Oh God, love him. Um, he was my partner in it, but we had to crawl in on our knees. Oh and once the fire was out, you had to, it was all darkness then. You had to crawl back out, following the hose on your knees. And you had the mask and right. you had the oxygen. And I, all of a sudden, I started to panic. And I couldn't get enough oxygen. And I was right by the door. And fortunately, Leo and, and another firefighter who was there, like, I'm just like, get this off of me. Get me. Like, <laughs> it, I just, I, I freaked. And... Um, you know, so so it was really an eye opener to see what they go through on a day to day basis, and um, and I think that it is something that people should see, even if it's just a video. Right. It would be nice for them to see that. I I agree a hundred percent. I mean, police officers, you know, any first responder, you know, what they go through every day, it it, it is insane. Now, before we touch on the climate a little bit, my last question to you is. Um, have you attended a police rally or a Black Lives Matter rally? I attended a police rally. Um, I did not attend a Black Lives Matter rally. I was going to. Um, I didn't go. Uh, my niece was going to go with me, and uh, she got held up. So I didn't end up going. Um, if people Google me, they will see that I've made some comments in the past, especially around the time of um, I-93 when they mm -hmm. had the protest and they blocked the highways. Mm -hmm. um, now, this was the Black Lives Matter? Uh, that they claimed to be the Black Lives Matter. Um, all of a sudden, it was uh, one morning um, during rush hour. They 
people put themselves in tubes and that may not be the best idea no, yeah and, and they blocked 93 uh coming from the north and block 93 coming from the south and they had people up videotaping so that they could make sure that the police didn't do anything to them or they'd sue them. See, at that, at that point, it, you're asking to be arrested. Yeah, I mean, it, exactly. It, it's, it's just the violence that the movement's portraying. I mean, personally, I mean, I've been to two uh, what they call Back the Blue rallies. I know, Richard, you I've sponsored been to a few as well. And you sponsored one of them. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason why I've gone to those is because they're very supportive, they're yeah. very peaceful. But I, I was thinking about attending a Black Lives Matter rally, but the thing about that is, you know, because I'm a Trump supporter, that's a burden to them. I, I can't go because of that. Apparently, I'm a racist for that. Yeah. It, it, it is difficult. I, I, I was a biology major, to be honest. I've never taken a sociology course. I've never taken mm -hmm. really any political science course. Um, and back when this thing happened with 93, um, right away, people because I filed legislation right. to say, if you do that and someone dies, you should be prosecuted for murder. Absolutely. I'm sorry. Absolutely. There, Absolutely. Was, there was no thought of the health and safety of the people on that highway. Absolutely not. Um, I got so many phone calls from people that they missed doctor's appointments that they had waited months for. Um, one was a, a doc, uh, was a, um, cancer patient he was waiting oh for a, a cancer a, a specialist he had waited months the doctor couldn't make it in you had a girl from that grew up in drake it who was in end stage ovarian cancer and they were transporting her by ambulance on 93 and she was stuck for three hours in the traffic her husband had gone the back roads and was waiting at mass general for three hours and she died three weeks to four weeks later. That was three hours they can never get back. And I had a gentleman call me, he was on his way to his mother's funeral oh my God. and didn't make it. You know, frankly, it doesn't matter what side you're on, you know, it doesn't matter what you're supporting or, or speaking out against. Yeah. Uh, if you do things like, you know, block highways or purposely try to disrupt, you know, the, yeah. the public, you know, I called them a terrorist. Uh, absolutely, it, absolutely, absolutely. It, it, Domestic it, terrorism. And then they called me a racist. And oh, that's um, how it works. It's, it is. Yeah. Welcome how it to works. our world. Yeah. Because I, like I said, uh, per, I support the concept Black Lives Matter because they do, and yeah. they deserve to be treated fairly. Right. But I, I won't support a movement that funds money into the wrong places. I won't support a movement that, you know, is is creating violence and is. So I guess I. What hap one of the things that happened at that point is they asked me if I, after calling me a racist and beating me up online, right. they asked me if I thought structural racism was a real thing. Oh, goodness and gracious. And never having even heard that, I, I said it was a fraud. And so now I'm even more of a racist. You know, I got to tell you that my mother's best friend from college mm -hmm. was black. Mm -hmm. My father was principal of Drake at High, as I said, and when he was moved to assistant superintendent, he was one who hired Dan Smith, who many people in this community know and love. Dan passed away a few years ago, but Dan was the first black vice principal in the town of Drakeit. My father was one of the ones that hired him. Um, they were good friends for, for their lives. Mm -hmm. um, my sister has, um, has step, a stepdaughter who has three children who are black. I, and I love them to death. They're my nieces right. and nephew. Um, so, you know, it, it, it aggravates me because now I've been told that if you're colorblind, that's not even good enough. See, at and, that point, you're getting too picky. You know, here's how I see it, all right? I feel like all three of us have said at least, you know, once this evening that black lives matter. Because mm -hmm. they do, you know, yep. and we all agree on that. Exactly. But you cannot sit there and call us racist for exposing the organization and all, and all the crappy things they do. You know what I mean? What we're not just because we're not going to believe lies we're all of a sudden you know we're racist no we're not gonna I, we're not gonna read into the lies because i'm sure none of us have done anything in our lives to to constitute us as racist no. okay. but nobody looks into that but you know i think part of it is has growing up in an area like right next door to lowell right the melting pot of america i mean i grew up knowing that every immigrant group that came in came in to the acre of Lowell and then moved themselves up and out and bought houses and all that. And that every immigrant 
population mattered and they you know right. so so it wasn't that anything was different you just happen to be a different color and uh, right. and people i don't i don't remember seeing anything that constituted a discrimination right. of any type um and you know so it's frustrating for me um and and there was actually a, a colleague of mine when i first started and she was uh, black and we we're all at this meeting and the state senator was introducing us to some program they were starting and at the very end of it she stood up and asked who was going to come to the black community and tell them about this proposal and i thought if i ever got up and said who's going to come to the white community and tell us I'd be a racist. Uh, and um, I, I think it's that whole idea where, you know, lots of the Black Lives Matter movement people think that every black person is oppressed. Well, the moment that you start thinking that every black person is oppressed is the, the, is the moment that you are the racist. Uh, absolutely, you know. And I've seen plenty of black advocates, um, one of them, Candace Owens, especially, who's spoke out against this movement and how terrible and the violence that they've committed. You know, I, a few months ago, I believe they were talking about um, updating the T in Boston and whatnot, and they were talking to this black woman, and she said, I don't think she might have been a politician, I don't believe she was, and she said that when they go to renovate the T, make it, you know, uh, upgrade and whatnot, that they need to focus on the T in black communities, and that really, you know, yeah. I kind of took a step back, and I'm like... What, what about, about the what else? about the rest of the communities? Not even just the not even just white people, but what about Hispanic people or, or Asian? Or, or Asian. Right. I, I Where's everyone else? Right. It's ridiculous. It, it, it's very it's very difficult, and um, it should be even for everyone. Right. And, Absolutely. And, you know, instead of um, maybe mm. underutilized or under, you know. Um, I don't know what you upgraded or, or, or right. whatever. You know, you want everyone to have the same access, and right. um, it, it shouldn't just be by color. You know, because there are also a lot of poor white folks. There is a lot of poor Hispanic folks, poor Absolutely. Asian mm -hmm. folks. Um, so every nationality has ha has some, and so um, it, it it it's just a, it's very difficult it's a difficult subject and you try to be very careful with how you do it but if you support the police automatically you're a racist and i sit right. there and go we have black police officers we exactly. have asian police right. officers i you know i support all police officers absolutely. absolutely and um you know even going back to that protest in the highway you know i was in an eight car pileup one time on going back and forth on 93. I know if somebody's not paying attention and somebody stops short, somebody could get killed. And, you know, that's why I felt that that was terrorism because they didn't care about the lives of right. anybody else. Somebody being rushed into the hospital, all of that. And that um, they could have been holding calling Gary signs for all I, right. I, and I would still say they were wrong. Absolutely. Right. You, know? you know? Now, sh shying away, I guess, from the police situation real quick, um, touching on the climate, you know, with the wildfires happening yeah. over the western U.S., you know, issues like greenhouse gases, um, pollution, deforestation, um, facing these types of challenges, in your opinion, what are some ways in President-elect Biden could help lead an effective strategy to dealing with some of these big issues? Well, I think the first thing is, is the fact that he would recognize that climate change is a re real thing that's happening, and right. it's not just a hoax. Right. Um, I, I think that we have to put more into the um, solar, wind, those kind of clean energies. I agree. Um, we actually had a plant that we got a big grant for that was out in Tingsboro, Beacon. Uh, unfortunately, they went bankrupt, but they were trying to do fly, flywheel technology where they would store the energy so when there were needs for energy, the energy right. would be there. Um, so uh, Tommy Golden, the rep from Lowell, who is the chair of the Energy Committee, has worked really, really hard on a bill. And it passed in the House in July. Um, it passed, a different version passed in the Senate. It's still in conference committee. I was talking to him today. He's hoping that, you know, we only have until January. We get sworn in the first Wednesday of January. So we have until the last Tuesday um, to pass anything. 
Uh, he's hoping that something, a compromise, will come out. Um, I have to say I did vote against it because of the TCI, the, the Transportation and Climate right. Initiative, because it would allow for, um, for taxes to be raised to go towards um, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, the idea is that uh, this could cost, especially people, there's a lot of commuters in, in my district, um, like 17 cents more a gallon oh for gasoline. Goodness. Um, it would be horrendous. And so that was a, a concern that I had with the bill. Uh, on the other hand, it, it, you know, it did have, um, and it would allow a bureaucrat make, to make that decision, not an elected official. No, thank you. Yeah. So um, it does, we, we invested in wind. Um, that down near the Somerset area, there's a, mm -hmm. a big proposal for down there. Um, it one of the huge things for us up here is the uh, gas pipeline safety initiatives that were in there. Um, obviously, we've been you know looking at this for several years now when they were going to put a pipeline in uh, and a compressor station and all that. So I've been kind of watching what's been going on in Weymouth. In Weymouth, they did build the plant and now they've actually put it on hold again and waiting to see. Um, so part of it also was economic justice mm -hmm. for those communities because they're saying that one community down near the Weymouth plant has a lot of pollution right. and how it's not good for their health and that we've got to look at, at the longer um, term health issues as well. Um, you, you know, climate as a whole, um, I always joke around with Joey, I, I consider him a, a tree-hugging hippie, uh, or he's definitely more uh, moderate. Oh, I, I consider myself an environmentalist. An yeah. environmentalist, yes. Um, me personally, I'm a little more reserved when it comes uh, to the climate. Do you view the issue as a whole as an emergency, like a, a crisis? How do you view the climate I think situation? we have to look at it, and we have to take it very seriously. The, mm -hmm. the bill that was passed would get us at zero, um, at zero by 2050. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the things that we have to do is start getting, if we're going to go that way, we need to make electric cars mm -hmm. cheaper, not more expensive Absolutely. than the regular car. When I got a car last year, I'm looking, I'm like, well, maybe I should look at the, you know, the electric ones. I'm like, it's so much more yeah. than, than that. And, and then um, I live in a very old house and I'm thinking, I'd have to upgrade my electricity <laughs> probably to plug this thing in. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, so we've got to make it more affordable for people. And um, it shouldn't be the poorer people who can't afford them who have to pay that extra 17 cents right. a gallon just to get to work. Um, so I think that's important. I think um, my niece, who's 22, has been really educating me a lot on, mm -hmm. on the environment and uh, climate change and all that. That was not something when I was in school that we right. learned about or that we, you know, um, studied about. Mm -hmm. um, the recycling is something that I'm learning, you know. Um, there's actually a great group out in Tingsboro, um, Sustainable Tingsboro, and, and, you know, they're on a Facebook page. And, you know, I even asked a friend of mine, not me, my, I'm still planning on using my signs again, but there's somebody okay. that has the corrugated plastic political signs and they're filled up in their basement and they want to know how do they get rid of it and it's not recyclable yet right although it was just on one of the news channels where they're cutting them and making them for accessible products for people um, like to put a, an iPad up on or right. things like that um, and they're reusing them that way but there's um, there's all sorts of things that I was glad to see Drake it has right now at the um, DPW, if you bring your flattened boxes, because so many people have been shopping online right. and the boxes are coming, um, we can drop the boxes off at, at, at that, but they have to be flattened. Right. Um, so I, I think the recycling is, is something that we need to do more of it. Of it. Um, and I think making reusable, um, you know, I've seen now where, you know, you bring your bottle in and you just fill the bottle at the water thing instead of buying bottles of right. water, you know, right. that I kind th of thing. Th that's a very effective way to, you know, reducing the amount of plastic that could be thrown on the streets right. or anything like that. Right. Now with, you know, just shy of about four minutes left here, 
Um, I guess our last main question Richard and I had for you was, you know, about the voter ID. Yes, I have sponsored the legislation to require a voter ID. Um, I don't see why we can't have that. Um, the arguments have been that the poor people can't afford one. Um, what gets me is if they can go in and they can apply for welfare and all that, what are they showing for IDs just to get identified right. that right. way? Um, so I think that, yeah, let them have a free ID, but let's get there, get them to have an ID so we know that it's the right person. Or even, you vote. know, not even necessarily does it need to be its own form of identification. You could, in my eyes at least, you could present things like a, a driver's license or, yep. um, or a state ID or something yep. like that. You know, we don't necessarily need a there's whole some, different... There's say some people who don't even have one of those. And, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's frustrating because you, you sit there and say it's so easy to make, a, you know, an ID at the Vogue or a, an ID at school or what, wherever. There, there's no reason why you, the registry of motor vehicles could not provide an ID. Absolutely. Right, and I think it ensures the safety and especially the safety of national elections to make sure, you know, who you are is that's you voting for, you know, whoever your candidate is. And honestly... Is. You know, if you're worried about the people who are homeless or who can't afford one, they need some kind of ID anyway. I mean, God right. forbid somebody, you know, homeless person dies by the river, who's even going to identify them? You know, everybody should have an ID. Right. You know, and frankly, you know, I'm not trying to stereotype at all, but people like, you know, homeless people and other people of that nature, I, I, to my knowledge, they don't even tend to vote, you know, as no. much as... Right. You know, people would think them to. You know, if you don't care enough to go out or to have an identification or go out and get one, are you really going to care about, you know, the election? That, that's actually one of the reasons why I did not support sending out the absentee ballot applications to every registered voter in the Commonwealth. I think it was $6 million or something like that. Oh, my goodness. Just to mail the applications. And I thought if people care enough about how to vote, they're going to find a way to vote. They're going to look right. online and see that there's an application online that they can print out right. and mail no, not in. Not to mention now, all the botched, you know, type of, I'm, I'm pretty sure we got multiple, you know, of the, um, of yeah. the same ones. But. Right. And it also goes out to say, you know, that one, a big question that looms around too is should felons be able to vote? Um, and it actually, you know, there was a study that was shown that said, you know, the majority of people in prison actually do not vote. Um, and that just goes to show, you know, how you were saying about homeless people not voting either. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, you know, unfortunately, we are kind of um, running out of time. We have about 40 seconds left. You know, it was wonderful having you on the show. Yes, sure, you know, we, we really Lewis. appreciated you coming Thank on. Thank you guys for having this. I think it's great that we've got young guys who are out there and trying to get more young people involved in, in, in politics and, and to understand it and that their voices can be heard. Right. Absolutely, you know, and if you can put our email on the screen, you know, if you have any uh, questions, comments, or concerns for us or, or Colleen or anything yep. like that, you know, you can reach us there. Um, anyways, uh, my name is Richard Silvio. My name is Joey Bigos. We this want we want to wish everyone a safe, happy holidays. Yep. And happy New Year's as well. Merry Christmas. Take care.